What's up, y'all? I'm KM Best. We are about to jump into a big patch review featuring not only the introduction of spotlight caches to Marvel Snap, but also a whole host of intriguing balance changes. Let's take a look at the cards that are going to be inside each of the spotlight caches week by week. Each week, there will be one new card and then two featured cards. The fourth spot in the cache will be filled up by a random Series 4 or Series 5 card. That random Series 4 or Series 5 card could be one that you already own. If it is, you will receive a premium mystery variant for that card, which, in my opinion, is not a very good outcome. So you do have to be aware that the fourth slot in most of these boxes is a potential pain point. Now, that said... In the week of 7-11, Jean Grey will be the new card, with Null and the Living Tribunal as the featured cards in the box. Then, 7-18, Echo will be the new card, with Iron Lad and Kang the Conqueror as the featured cards in her box. Then, the week of 7-25 sees Legion as the new card and High Evolutionary and Darkhawk as the featured cards in his box. Finally, Mirage comes out the week of 8-1 and is the new card in her box, of course, with Thanos and Master Mold as the featured cards. To my mind, if you have no Series 4 and 5 cards, I would advise targeting the week of 725. High Evolutionary is an extremely powerful card, as is Darkhawk. However, we can't really talk about High Evolutionary without jumping into the balance changes because, uh, spoiler alert, little bit of some high evo nerfs in there so let's jump over to that high evolutionary himself is not necessarily receiving a nerf he remains a four cost four power card and keeps all his current text what is changing is what his evolutions do to two important cards wasp and hulk wasp instead of afflicting two units with minus one power is now only going to afflict one unit with minus one power hulk rather than gaining his plus two no matter where he is, is going to be gaining his plus two power only if he is in hand or in play. In addition, this will fix the bug that involves him not gaining power if you pass the final turn of the game with energy floating. In terms of how this affects high evolutionary decks, I think it's probably a change that was very needed. High Evolutionary Wasp and High Evolutionary Hulk have been the standout cards in most High Evolutionary archetypes. I personally believe that most High Evolutionary Lockjaw decks will still run these cards. After all, ripping a Hulk early is still pretty damn good because it's still getting that plus two, and Wasp was always a bit of a free roll in those lists regardless. So High Evolutionary Jane Jaw, I would expect to stick around. One thing that might not stick around is the Hulk just sort of being in a bunch of random control decks because he is, you know, the strongest there is. That might not be true anymore. I'm a little interested to see if this opens up more space in the high evolutionary deck building strategy sphere. And I do think that while high evolutionary Lockjaw will stick around, I'd be interested to find out how the rest of the high evolutionary package might start to shine. For example, cards like Cyclops are already very strong. The Thing is pretty good. Abomination, when there's a lot of Cyclops and the Thing happening, could be pretty reasonable. However, it should be pointed out that the Wasp nerf is also a bit of a stealth nerf to Abomination, as Wasp was one of the most important ways of making sure your Abomination was actually playable, because she would always hit two things if they were in the lane, and thus discount Abomination by two. There were a couple of other balance changes, although to my mind, they don't impact the meta nearly as much as the high evolutionary ones. Mystique is now changing to the point that she copies an on-reveal and an ongoing if the card she is copying had an on-reveal as well. The example I would use would be Soulstone. Now, if you play Mystique on a Soulstone, you will get the on-reveal effect of the Soulstone, which is drawing a card, in addition to the ongoing effect of the Soulstone, which is, of course, giving opponents cards minus one power at that location. This does raise Mystique's value a little bit. Like, it's not the most impactful thing ever, and actually there are very few cards where this will ever matter, and one of them is Electro, where you don't ever want to do that. But, hey, we'll take it. 
Now, this buff makes the beta player in me pretty excited. For those who are unaware, during the beta, Nakia had basically this ability, except it was giving your entire hand plus two power. And as a consequence, she was an absolutely meta-defining card. A lot of decks revolved around not playing a lot of cards early and then playing Nakia, playing an enormous amount of power on turn six. So you'd have Sarah decks that would do this. You would have discard decks that would try to hit it with Swarm. Just a ton of power output on turn six is available with a card like Nakia. Now, instead of giving plus two to the entire hand, she's just going to give plus one. But as a three cost, three power card, that could actually be pretty useful. An immediate home for her would be Silver Surfer. So you could put Nakia in Silver Surfer. Hitting things like Brood is obviously phenomenal. Depending on how far you want to lean into this kind of power, I think there could be a lot of upside towards playing a deck with Nakia in it. She becomes immediately a very relevant card. And of course, her three cost is absolutely a benefit in the context of cards like Silver Surfer existing. This is a legitimate buff to Silver Surfer, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw her elsewhere as well. This is just a powerful effect to have. Speaking of cards that maybe might show up in Silver Surfer decks, Gambit actually is now a 3-cost, three 3-power three card up from 3-1, and instead of being able to infinitely fire, even if you have no cards in hand, now requires a card in hand. What's interesting about this is I actually think that that move to 3-3 makes him a lot more viable as a part of the normal discard archetype. Blowing up a unit is an underratedly powerful thing to do, and if Spider-Ham wasn't ruining the dreams of every discard player by turning their apocalypse into a pig right now, I would almost say the discard archetype would be competitively viable with this card. One thing that is worth noting, though, is a lot of the current best builds of discard are not running any real random discard because of how dangerous it can be. It's all Colleen Wings and Lady Sifts and Modocs, right? So you set your hand up for the big Modoc, and so perhaps the existence of Gambit as a truly random discard does not actually end up making the discard deck itself better. But still, a 3-3 that blows something up, that's really not bad in the Silver Surfer deck. Imagine the final turn play of, you know, after you play a Sarah, you play something like Killmonger Gambit Silver Surfer. That seems quite powerful to me. I don't really know if it's 100% going to get there, but it definitely seems like a card that's worth exploring. I also wanted to talk about what I consider a bit of the elephant in the room on this patch, which is what didn't get nerfed. It is my belief that Pity Pride and Hit Monkey are simply too strong, and that this deck, the Bounce deck, is the sort of baseline best deck in the metagame, and that this deck, Bounceless Bounce, has a very overpoweringly good matchup against it, while maintaining a positive matchup spread in basically a ton of other matchups. I think hitting High Evolutionary without hitting Kitty Pride or Hit Monkey is a bit of a miss. So, I was able to ask a question to one of the developers, and without breaking my NDA as much as possible, I will say that they did indicate to me that the patches are more about adding balance knobs in the future, and that Bounce was definitely on their radar in upcoming OTAs, potentially. Now, obviously, this is not confirmation of anything. I don't know anything beyond what I was told and what I have permission to disclose. But... I do get the sense that it is possible that the OTAs could be where we see changes to bounce. That said, it has to be soon. I personally, I think maybe we've been a little bit spoiled in Marvel Snap in terms of just how quickly things get nerfed and how quickly things get changed. And I think that reasonably we can be, you know, maybe make it like another week or two before this bounce thing gets gone, but... If I have to do another Infinity Conquest with Bounce or metagaming heavily against Bounce with Invisible Woman and Killmonger, I will be a little bit disappointed. Speaking of things that were a little bit disappointing to see, but not entirely unexpected, there will be no series drops this month. I know a lot of people have been expecting it. I think, really, that the one card that I would like to see not ever in a spotlight cache would be Snowguard. So as long as they get some series drops before Snowguard shows up, because she's not in this month's caches, I'm not going to be too mad. I also don't really want to see Howard the Duck in any of these caches. 
I'm hoping we can at least get Snowguard and Howard out of Series 4 and Series 5 and out of Spotlight caches before they ever show up. But it would be a mistake to record this video without mentioning, hey, series drops aren't happening right now, and I'm not exactly sure if they're going to happen in the future. I personally kind of expect that it ends up being something more along the lines of, you know, when Series 4 and 5 fills up to the degree that they're happy with, then they'll start dropping things down. I don't think the monthly schedule is something we're going to see until that happens. Finally, I'd like to provide a little bit of advice as to how I would approach using your spotlight caches. The first tip I'd like to give you is that you should almost never be opening spotlight caches unless you have four and unless you have a specific target in mind. So let's say you want to open on the second week, the week of 718, and you're trying to get Echo. I would not try to do that unless you also wanted Iron Lad or you were a full collection and really wanted Echo, and unless you were willing to go for four full spotlight caches to get that card. That's a big ask for a new card, because of course, since it's a new card, we don't exactly know how good it is yet. So there is a bit of FOMO with these spotlight caches, especially if the new card ends up being quite powerful. What I would advise you to do is take your time. You have a full week to figure out if you want to acquire this card or not. I would advise you to take advantage of that full week. In addition, I think if you end up in a situation where you have absolutely no cards from Series 4 and Series 5, you should almost ignore the new cards entirely unless they're completely broken. For example, if you had no cards in Series 4 and Series 5, it would be dramatically better to target the week of 725 with High Evolutionary and Darkhawk on it than it is to target basically any other week unless one of those new cards ends up being absolutely meta-defining. Thanks so much for watching. As always, I've been Cam Best. Thank you so much for making it this far in the video. I really appreciate it. What are your thoughts on the balance changes, and which week are you going to be targeting on the Spotlight Cache? Let me know in the comments. I read every single one of them. Thank you so much, and keep an eye out for a more in-depth dive into the Spotlight Cash system in which week I would go for. We're going to be reviewing every single one of the cards that is available, so hopefully that helps you make a decision as well. Keep an eye out for that tomorrow. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you in the next one.